Today we're going to be talking about is it wrong to be wealthy? There is a common notion that uh, well, wealth, is it a blessing or is it a curse? Is it something that we should seek for? Or is it something that we should avoid? Is it wrong to have wealth or to have a, an abundance of things? What is God's will for our life and how can we know of certainty what is God's plan for your life in regards to wealth or not? Uh, is is wealth the, the root of all evil? We're going to be looking at that today. First, my name is Enoch Leffingwell, founder of the Army of Youth, and here we help uh, young people to identify their unique talents and to dedicate them to the Lord's service. This is something that interests you. I encourage you to subscribe and follow us on social media so you can get more messages just like this one. And uh, today we're going to be looking at the subject of wealth and presenting a new perspective, some that uh, many may not have heard today. We're going to be looking at bringing new light to this old truth. Is it wrong to be wealthy? Uh, this, first of all, it's uh, where where does wealth come from? Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter eight eighteen. Deuteronomy chapter eight eighteen. And can I get a volunteer to be able to read this for us? Thank you, Sherry. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto the, to thy fathers as it is this day. Absolutely. So who, who gives us power to get wealth? Satan? The Lord our God. It's the Lord our God. Now, would God give you something that would be a curse? No. He's here. He's here to uh, give us that power, that strength to get wealth. The, the difficulty is what we find is uh, a lot of times it's what we believe about the subject that's going to cause us to um, struggle. Like I know for a long time I believed, see I've been in full-time ministry for about nine years now, and, um, and a lot of times I used to associate missionary with poor. I thought to be a missionary, to work for God is going to be poor. It's like I don't mind being a poor missionary and just not not have different things in life and, and that's okay with me but that was my my belief about it or if uh if you believe that money is the root of all evil then do you think you're going to want to have money in life absolutely not you're going to try to avoid the root of all evil because who really honestly wants to be evil um and but the bible doesn't say that the bible actually says it's the love of money is the root of all evil and one thing that I want to challenge our mentality today is I want to redefine what wealth looks like. Is wealth only confi confined to um, finances? What are some other ways that we can have wealth? We can have spiritual wealth, yes. We can have a wealth of friends. We can have a wealth of friends. We can have... Yes. So knowledge. Knowledge. Actually, absolutely. So, um, what what is your ultimate wealth? What is the greatest wealth that you have? Your health. Your your health. Absolutely. So, if someone, um, I, what I want to submit to us is that, um, it, so we can we can have a uh, we can be rich in faith. And um, a lot of times we can experience, um, I, wealth, wealth is not just, just financially, although it can include that, but um, a lot of times we like shy away from that, but does God want us to be healthy? In 3 John chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper, that succeed, and be in health, even as thy soul prosperous. So God cares about the whole well-rounded experience. He wants us uh, to have that in, in life. Um, so if we, um, we might have, I mean, someone can have finances, but if they don't have the friends or the family and they're disconnected from all the people in their lives that, that matter to them, is that really a, a, well, is that a wealthy person? That, or is that man bankrupt in his relationships? He's 
And a lot of people, they sacrifice their health so they can get wealth for the first 40 years and then they sacrifice their wealth for the last 30 years to regain their, their lost health. So I, w when I'm saying wealth or abundance, I want us all to be thinking not just in terms of one facet, one area of life, but to think about life in all of its, uh, all of all seven areas of life and seeing that we, um, we, we have a family, and then I'm going to put on here your calling. So both, both spiritually, uh, personally, professionally, God is uh, looking, He has a plan so that we don't have to sacrifice one. Like I, I remember for so long, it wasn't until I began to understand this principle of having an abundant mindset versus having a scarcity mindset where I, I used to believe that in order for me to succeed in um, any of these areas, it has to be at the cost or expense or the sacrifice of something else. It's like how many people have, have ever believed that you can't have it all, but if to succeed in one, you have to fail in some others? Yeah, yeah this is a common belief because it's based on scarcity. It's based on limitation and fear. Um, but that's not what the Word of God says. And so what I would s submit to you is John 10.10, 10, Jesus said that Christ came that we might have life and have life more what? Abundant. Abundantly. So another word for abundance is, is wealth. Or we could look at, the, we could say rich, whatever it is. Is it wrong to be wealthy? No. But is there a wealth? Is there an abundance that is wrong that the Scripture warns against? Yes. yes. Now, what is, what is the difference between the right kind of wealth and the wrong kind of wealth? A, um, Daniel chapter 4 describes how uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was looking at this great Babylon. He said, is this not the great Babylon that I have built from the power of my hand and the might of my majesty? It is this me, myself, and I. The wealth that is wrong is the selfish wealthy, the, the wealth that is consumed upon our lust, that is not given or, or used for the glory of God or for the service and contribution of His, His work and the service of others. So it's, it's really what, it, the difference between good wealth and bad wealth is your heart and your mind. It is the motives that prompt the accumulation of that wealth. It could be accumulation of friends, but if you do it with the wrong motive, that influence becomes not good. And here we are gathered together because we want to, um, this is, we call this the leadership table because leadership is the skill of influence, nothing more, nothing less. Every man, woman, and child has influence, but the question is, are we using our influence to lead others to Christ? And we can, is, is it possible to be gaining influence for the wrong reason? Yeah, a absolutely. Um, and is it, but if you, if you recognize that the friends that you have in your life, uh, that you are a representative of Christ to those individuals, then who you come in contact with is going to, uh, when they come in contact with you, they don't come in contact with you, they come in contact with Christ through you, which is the hope of glory, then that is the right motive for having a wealth of relationships to being rich in social uh, relations. This is uh, what God is showing. So there is a wealth that is wrong, and then there's a healthy wealthy. And that, that healthy motive is what makes all the difference. But where did this, this desire to accumulate wealth originate? Where did this, where did this um, begin? Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 9 and verse 7. And can I get a volunteer to read Genesis 9, 7? Thank you, Giselle. Thank you. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 7. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. So what was the command of God in that, in that verse? To be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly. Yeah, so we see that another name for abundance is be fruitful 
and we see to multiply. Now, does God want you to be fruitful? Amen. Absolutely. But how? He wants you to be fruitful abundantly. Now, the desire to accumulate wealth it originated... Um, um, it's an original affection of our nature implanted there by our Heavenly Father for noble ends. It is for the glory of God, for the service of Him. And another way that you could look at um, this, it is, um, it's basically recognizing like your talents. Like, like many of these things, these are all, all, all the talents that we have that are gifts to us. They're not really belong to us, they belong to God. So the influence, the friends that we have, that, that's a gift. The knowledge we have, it's a gift. Each of these things are our talents that God gives us. And the question is, how are we using our talents? Is it for the glory of God or is it for the service of ourself? And, and, um, and so that, that's the big question. So hopefully what we see is that, um, that it's not wrong to be wealthy. It's wrong to be wealthy for selfish motives. So you have to ask why are you seeking to get wealth and who does the glory go to when you acquire that wealth? Are you able to recognize God in, in the, the times of prosperity as well as adversity? That's the big question. A lot of often uh, the idea, or some people believe that when they see someone who's wealthy or rich, they're like, ah, oh, that person is selfish, that person is covetous, that person is just hoarding up stuff for themselves. It's wrong for them to have, have all those things. And uh, they are, and then people start to, to, like sometimes poor people covet the rich man's um, just lifestyle or person or personality or options that they have. But that is, that's actually like, uh, poor people can be greedy as well. Um, and you don't have to be wealthy um, or you don't have to be rich in order to, um, to have the love of money. Because what we see is, um, I really liked what Margaretha was sharing last week was, um, it's like finances, a lot of, a lot of poor people believe that um, when, I, when I get rich or when I get more money, then I will give to the poor. Then I will give back to God. Then I'll be faithful with returning to God the tithe or whatever the case is, when I get more money, then I will give. But it, money doesn't change your character. Money doesn't change your decisions. It takes who you already are and it amplifies it, along with any of these. Influence takes who you are and amplifies it. Health takes who you are and amplifies it. A lot of these things, the knowledge, it just, it, it, it amplifies who you are. So if we're not giving to the poor today, then we're not gonna give later on if the Lord blesses us with more. So um, if we have one dollar, if we have one dollar, God is asking for that tenth, that tithe. And if we are not faithful with that 10 percent, then why, with a dollar, then why would God trust us with a with hundred dollars? And um, a lot of times in our scarcity, in our scarcity, in our poverty, in our, in our lack, uh, we are thinking, I cannot give to God because I don't have enough. There's, there's something that is missing. And if I miss out, then I don't want to be without. And if I trust God, if I obey God, if I give to Him, if I, if I help others, then I won't have. And it's this self, like scarcity on its core is a foundation of selfishness. It is one of the highest levels of selfishness is thinking of scarcity. And, um, and like my favorite verse, it says that if we're, Luke 16, 10, if we're faithful in that which is least, we'll be faithful also in much. And, and if we're un unjust in that which is least, we'll be unjust also in much. So whatever it is, um, if we are un if we're unfaithful, with the little, with the dollar that God gives us, if we can't give 10% back to Him, why would He trust us with more? So um, the unwillingness to give to others that which we have, because we don't have enough, that is, we could be poor and still have the love of money, which is the root of all evil. 
The root of all evil is selfishness. It's that love for money. And it doesn't matter how much you have. Wealth, and I really want you to get this, write this down. Wealth is not about how much you have. It's wealth is a mindset. Wealth is about are you, what are you grateful for that which you have? That is the secret to abundance. That's the secret to having more in life. There are two perspectives that, um, there, there are two lenses that we can look at life. We're, right now we're looking at the faculty of perception. One of the seven faculties, we're not going into detail on that. We have other videos explain that. But right now the faculty of perception is how do you perceive the world? There are two lenses you can look at life and every decision is filtered through one of these two lenses. The first lens is scarcity. There's not enough, there's missing, there's limitations, or the other is abundance. Wealth is a mindset. Wealth is a decision. Regardless of how much you have right now, you can choose to be wealthy by recognizing that which you have. See, there's, there's a, the famous uh, concept where you know, you have, you have this, this glass, but the question is, uh, well, when you, you have that glass filled with water, uh, and the, the pessimist says that the glass is half empty. The optimist says that the glass is half full, but the psalmist says that my cup runneth over in Psalms 23. So, it's a, it's, a, it's a perception, it's a belief about life. Which one are you? Are you the optimist, the pessimist, or are you the psalmist that recognizes the abundance of God, that there's no limit to His abundance, and when you are connected to the gift giver, then there's no limit to what you can give? That's the question. That is true wealth. Yes. Could you repeat that sentence? Wealth is not about how much you have, but about... Um, what are you grateful, uh, like, are you grateful for that which, is ha what, which you have? It's about being grateful for that which you have. That's what it means to be wealthy. It's an attitude of gratitude. And abundance is there whether you perceive it or not. But um, you see, even, even the first temptation of, of, uh, of Adam and Eve, there was... Uh, the first temptation of Adam and Eve, God planted man where? In a garden. He planted them in the garden. And, and God said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, He said, of, of all these trees, you may what? Freely. You may freely eat. See, free, freely, freedom, this is also another watchword or phrase for... Um, for abundance. So you may freely eat. Abundantly is given all these different options and possibilities, but in the midst of the garden, that tree of knowledge and good and evil, you shall not eat. There's the one thing, the very one thing that you should not touch or eat because you're going to die when you do. Disobedience to God. When you look at the very first temptation of mankind, it was a temptation of scarcity. Eve had to walk through all of her abundance in the garden in order to reach her scarcity. In order to partake of that forbidden fruit, she had to uh, ignore and avoid and wade through all the abundance so that she can get to the scarcity. The very first sin, was, the first temptation was based on scarcity. And so it is with every other sin that we would commit, it's on this mindset of there's not enough or focusing on what's missing or just being inadequate or it's this mindset of scarcity. There's a limitation. We're limited. Well, but God is showing that we're actually limitless through Christ who strengthens us. We can do all things. So we, we can see can't do or can do. Just it's, it's what attitude do you have um, through Christ who ha who's faithful and true and His promises are just. So uh, the, 
one of the the number one greatest things that will uh, the the number you want to know what is like the single greatest blocker of abundance in your life that in, in each of these areas the one thing that will block that will prevent you from experiencing abundance that will that will limit you from ever reaching the infinite potential Christ has in your life that is ingratitude. Ingratitude is the greatest blocker of abundance because ingratitude can make a rich man poor, but gratitude can make a poor man rich. And um, this could be rich in energy, rich in health, rich in knowledge, rich in friends. Now, what does this look like? One, um, if we're focusing on, on what's missing, what's lacking, the scarcity, then when you're given an opportunity to share your faith, when you're given an opportunity to teach a Bible study, to speak up, are you saying, are you asking the question like, what if, what if I get asked a question and I don't have the answer? Or if I don't know the answer? Which one is this? Is this scarcity or is this abundance? Scarcity. This is scarcity. And then it causes pain and suffering. People don't don't, the, the truth is, like, if, if you're asking this, then you're definitely not going to answer. You won't have the answer just by, by virtue of being afraid of it. You're not going to speak. You're not going to share. You won't be able to bless that individual because of the question that we're asking ourselves is dictating our, our focus. Or you could realize, like the woman at the well, like, how much did she know? Or, or the demoniacs who were delivered by Christ. They were the first missionaries that were sent to Decapolis as he the nation. And God said, go share what great things God has done for you and, um, and has compassion on you. So what do you have? What do you know? And what can you share from that which you have? The question that should concern us mo- most is not how much has God entrusted to you, but what are you doing with that which you have? This is a mindset of wealth and a mindset of abundance. Is this making sense for us? Mm -hmm. Are there any questions, comments so far? Yes. I was just thinking as you're speaking that, you know, sometimes, sometimes on, on, I feel like I'm really selfish, and um, and I mm, not so giving, you know, or I want to create wealth in the wrong way or something like that, and and then the next day I might be so giving and so willing, and you know, and then the next day be real selfish again, and um, I just want people to know that we go through that, we do go through that. Yes, and. And the truth is, oh, can you go to uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14? Hebrews 5, 14. And can you read that for us? To me? Yes, please. Yeah. But strong meat belongeth to them that are are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So how do we get really strong with our, with our gratitude? Is exercise. By exercise, by reason of use. The, as the old saying goes, if you don't use it, you what? Lose it. You lose it. So if you don't use your abundance, if you don't recognize the, the abundance you have and use it, it's by putting to use that you grow. It's the law of imparting. By giving is, is really the, uh, you, you can't outgive God. So in like manner, uh, gratitude is like a muscle or a skill that you can cultivate, you can develop, you can strengthen. The more that you exercise it, the stronger it gets. So at first it's like, yeah, it's easy to, to study the Word of God and see what God says about abundance. And they're like, whoa, this is powerful. And then, then one day, you, you want to be abundant. You want to be generous. You want to be liberal in your gifts, your love, your care, your knowledge. And you are. And then the next day, you're like really struggling and you're suffering. And you're like, oh no, what am I doing? What do I do? And, and you're like, you go abundance and then scarcity. And sometimes it's in a moment. You just flip the switch and it's like, what do I do? So just know that this is a muscle 
and the more you exercise the easier it will get till eventually that gratitude will become your habit your natural inclination will be will be closer to uh, the abundance that God has in your life rather than the scarcity that Satan wants you to fear and uh, these are these are the, the things that that uh, make a big difference Amen. so uh, mom I really like I love your story that you share about the river would you be willing to share with us that I would I love that story too it's like um there God has enough for us and um, we could see it through a river because if we went to the river and um, we we had a series of things we could bring and one person brings a spoon and another one brings a bucket or another one brings a, a wheelbarrow and the other one brings a truck um, th the person with the spoon they're they're like spooning out the water and and the river doesn't know the difference it just keeps on flowing and, and it doesn't even put a dent in the river and so on um, by by taking the taking the water let's say we were trying to fill up a tank and if we took that spoon and we spoon by spoon was filling up that tank um it would be difficult to fill up that tank and then a person who has the bucket depending on how big their bucket is it's like if they're dipping it into the river the river doesn't know any difference it just keeps on flowing and, and it doesn't even make the streamline go down and it would take a while to fill up that tank too and so just imagine the person who comes with the truck they have they they have a better chance of quickly filling up that bucket so getting their needs met and and still the river still doesn't know the difference it's, absolutely it's wonderful thank you very much for sharing it is a powerful concept because it's that vehicle whatever the container it is that you use that is going to be the mindset that you have that you approach life which lens do you choose to look through and to what degree of abundance do you see um, where um, like like whether you're going to bring a truckload of knowledge or you're going to bring a spoon or you're going to have it's the limiting beliefs that we have about what god can do through you that really determine how much you're able to experience that quality of life to how much you can live the calling that God has placed on your life and that river is uh, there's another like object lesson we can learn from the rivers is that uh, the river is is doing what is the river just staying still what is it constantly doing it's, flowing. it's constantly flowing it's ever moving so in order to have greater ab abundance and part of the concept of abundance is progress we need to be making continual progress and growth there's no limit to what we can grow in Christ Jesus progress equals happiness you go back to a time where you were unhappy where you were unsatisfied where you were stuck in a period or a season of life where you were really struggling and I'll show you a period of life where you weren't making the progress that, that you felt that you should have or you were not focusing on the progress you were focusing on the scarcity of, of your progress this is, this is it but as you continue to make progress you'll have more just by reason of use, by strength it's that muscle, it's, that, it's the law of imparting it's, it's really cause and effect so what, what I'm sharing to you really I'm sharing with you the, the, the heaven ordained laws of abundance that is governing how you can have an abundant life a lot of times we read John 10:10 10, 10 and we're like yeah Christ wants us to have life more abundantly but what does that look like practically how do we apply that in our everyday life how can we experience that abundant life because a lot of times when we go different places and we see I like we don't see people living that abundant life experience but you can choose it today and and these are the, the secrets of the Bible just being revealed to us like I can't tell you it wasn't until I understood this principle here the scarcity versus abundance fundamentally where I began to realize like it took me a while because I'll be honest I was thinking like rich had some negative connotation it had some like 
some views in my mind where I'm like, yeah, that's not God's will or that's not good. Or it's like, maybe it's not wrong to be rich, but it's like, it is for me. Or that, that's not, that's not like where, that, that's not something I could do. But as I was thinking that, then it, it's also because I had the wrong view of what rich really was. It's the meaning that we attach to these words, uh, which is why I'm laboring to help us to see the different definitions. But the more that I began to study and the more that I was opening to this idea, as I study my devotions, you're going to find from today, you will see abundance everywhere. The whole word of God will explode and it will open to your understanding. You'll never see it the same again. And once you believe, when you settle in, like it took me a while. Like I began to see it and see it and see it. And God just like, look, this is my will for you. This is my plan. I have abundance. Will you trust me? Will you trust me? And I was slow. Like I'll admit it. I was, I was kind of hard hearted. Um, slow of faith to really believe this in all seven areas of my life. And it wasn't until I began to really settle and say, okay, this is a principle of heaven. This is how God operates. And when we are in God's will, the safest and happiest place on earth in the will of God, then he gives us that, um, that freedom. He, he has an abundance in his will. And so often we attribute God's will to scarcity. Like there's only one thing, there's only one possible way. We get into a binder s- stuck and we're like, we're like, oh no, what's going on? Like, uh, like the children of Israel, they were trying to be delivered from Egypt. And, they were, and Moses is like, oh, I know what to do. I, I'm trained in military. So he goes and he kills the Egyptian. But that wasn't God's way of delivering them. So he had a, a, a limited view of the character and, and the deliverance of God. Then they show up to the Red Sea and we're like, oh no, this obstacle is our destruction. We got Chariot's Pharaohs and his, uh, Pharaoh's chariots and his ho- hosts. They're like racing on us and we're all trapped. And the children of Israel are like, look, Moses, you brought us out here to kill us. You don't, you don't love us. They're doubting that his, his uh, care, his love, his intention. They're like, they're like, you brought us out here to die. And they're looking at the Red Sea, at that obstacle as the problem, but it's actually the way. God used what could have been for their destruction for their deliverance. Because why? God has a thousand ways to provide of which we know nothing. And if we truly believe that God's love for us is abundant and he means to do us well, then we'll cease to worry about the future. All worry, all stress, all anxiety will, will disappear when we really focus and believe that God's love is abundant for us and He means to do us well. It's when we start limiting our beliefs on God's love for me, when we start limiting God's, God's uh, well intentions for me, that's when we start stressing, worrying, and finding pain uh, and experience. Like, look back at a time when you were suffering when you're suffering pain, when you're going through a really hard time, name one painful experience in your life where you were not focusing on scarcity. If you show me a painful experience, I will show you an experience of one focusing on scarcity. The source of all our pain, misery, suffering, and loss is the scarcity mindset with that experience, with that event, with that person, with, that, with those words, whatever it is. And again, scarcity is selfishness at its very roots because it's, it's thinking about me, myself, and I and what limitations I have and it's trying to protect ourselves rather than recognizing an abundance, an all-sovereign, protective, loving, caring God has an abundant ways to provide and He is there to protect. It's, it's just... Uh, the law of, of self-preservation is the law of self-sacrifice. Like we will we'll lose our life by trying to save it. But when we give our life for Christ and the service of man, that's when we really tr- find our life. We find our purpose. We find meaning and we find abundance. And we start succeeding in all seven areas of life. What was the question you asked that you challenged us? My challenge is look back at a time when you were suffering pain and name one painful experience where you are not focusing on scarcity. Thank you. Pain, misery, loss. It's the results of focusing on scarcity. It's the thoughts of lack, limitation, what's missing, rather than 
being grateful for what you have. This is a thing. So in any moment, like, like you can't, you can't name an experience. Like I, I, there's been so many times I've been going through a struggle and I'm just like, I remember one time I was stressed out because these phone calls, I got them all at, at the same day and I'm like, oh man, what do I do? And there, there's these important phone calls. I've stepped out of my comfort zone, never done them before, thinking I don't even know what to say. And I'm thinking like, I, I've never been here before. I don't have the skills. I'm thinking of all scarcity and lack. And I'm, and I'm not thinking of scarcity. I'm just thinking that's like, I'm so inadequate for these phone calls. I don't know how to handle this. And I just remember being really stressed and overwhelmed about it. And I, I decided to go for a walk. And as I'm, I'm, I'm going for a walk, I remember you could be worried or you could be grateful, but you can't be both at the same time. You could be stressed or you could be grateful, but you can't be both at the same time. Any painful emotion across the board, there's no painful emotion that you can experience and be grateful at the same time. So I realized I'm overwhelmed. Now, if I'm overwhelmed, that means I'm not being grateful. But I was like, okay, what can I be grateful for about this situation? And I'll be honest with you, I did not want to answer that question. I'm like, I don't want to, what, what can I be grateful for? It's like, this is a stressful situation. I kind of want to be overwhelmed. Like, I don't like think those words, but you know that, 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 uh, that reserve, that, that hold, like that, that push, pullback uh, from asking like, what can I be grateful for about this trial, about this problem, about this difficult challenge? And then, then I just, cause I knew that I'm overwhelmed by faith, by principle, because of scarcity. So if I could look at, at gratitude for what I have, then it will change my emotion. I'm like, okay. And then when I'm in a better emotional state, I can make better decisions and then handle it, make phone calls or whatever is needed. And I start thinking like, well, I guess I have been praying every day in my account book for, to be able to talk to some of these people. And now they're reaching out. I'm like, okay, well, what else can I be grateful for? I'm like, well, I'm grateful that they're interested in the army of youth and they want to help send people in our direction that we can train them for evangelism. I'm like, well, that's a blessing. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be able to work with these people because I like the, the idea of working together with them. And so th as I started to, to recognize how God is answering my prayers, it changed everything. It's like instantly I went from that stress and overwhelm to joy and determination and strength and like we can do this like I, I know what I need to do and it transformed everything but it's are you focusing on what's missing or what you're grateful that you have that's Amen. that's the question Thank you. so the questions that we ask ourselves is uh, asking questions I want you to see write this down asking questions unlocks abundance Asking questions unlocks abundance. Asking questions is a skill that you can develop. And as leaders, we must develop the skill of asking great questions. Because a lot of times, we're, like if we ask, Jesus said, ask and you shall what? Receive. Receive. So why is the reason that we don't have, we have not received anything in our life? Because we're asking the wrong question. You have not because what? You ask, yes. you ask not. What is the reason why we have lack or poverty or, or, or scarcity in our life? Because we're asking for what? The wrong question. The, a lousy question. And by asking these lousy questions, we have more scarcity because that's what you're asking for. Like when I'm asking, what? okay, I, I have opportunity to give a Bible study. What if I get asked and I don't have the answer? That's a lousy question. But if you ask, well, what if I get asked a question and God gives me the words? What if God's word is true and he will give me the words to say in that moment? What if this is my opportunity? What if this was the day I was born for and fulfilling my purpose? Like that's a better question. Amen. So what are you going to find more of? Purpose, answers, preparation, words from God? Because you're asking for it. But there's a special way that we have to ask in, in James 1, 5. Let, can I get a volunteer to read James 1, 5 through 6? James chapter uh, 1, verses 5 through 6. When we ask these questions, asking questions unlocks abundance. And you can unmute um, on Discord if you want to read James 1, 
uh, verses 5 and 6. Go ahead. If any of you, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask, God, ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth it not. And it shall be given him, but let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven in the wind and tossed. So when we ask these questions, how should we ask? In faith. Ask in faith. Or in other words, when you ask, you have to ask with absolute certainty in three things. And number one, there is an answer. And number two, I will find it. And number three, it will be worth it when I do. When I ask that question, what can I be grateful for about this problem, about this trial, about this issue? I have to believe with absolute certainty there's an answer. There is something that I can be grateful for. Why? Because the Word of God says, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, In how many things give thanks? All. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Would God ask you to be thankful for something that would do you harm? No. No. So I can know without a shadow of a doubt, with absolute certainty, that in all things, every trial, in your darkest days, the most traumatic experience, the most, the deepest, most painful moments, there is something that we can be grateful for if we only look for it. But what is the condition? So there is an answer. I will find it when. Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says the law of focus. What you focus on, you what? You find. find. He says, seek and you shall find. find. So I will find it and it will be worth it when I do. When you ask in absolute certainty of those three things, these questions, you will have greater abundance in your life. You will, f you will find that you have a wealth of opportunities, a wealth of options, a wealth of relationships, a wealth of things, um, of people, of faith, of the very things that you desire and crave most, the things that God has promised. You will have an abundance of when you learn to master the skill of asking questions. Is this making sense to us? Amen. Because, yes. and, and we see in that verse that if any of you lack what? Wisdom. wisdom. So we got wisdom, knowledge. There's, you know one phrase that I believe is really limiting people so much in life that is just, uh, it's, it's really a cop out. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And when you, we're faced with a decision, hey, what do you think we should do? I don't know. It's like, um, what's, it's like, we got a problem here. Like, how can we fix this problem? How can we solve this problem? I don't know. This, a lot of people, they say, hey, I've got a suggestion. I don't know. Um, but I think maybe we should, um, I don't know, we should, we should um, go do this. But all, all this time we're saying, I don't know. Your words are seeds. Jesus said in, in Luke 8, I believe it's 8, 12, he says the seeds are the words. So what you sow is what you what? Reap. What you reap. That's Galatians 6, 9. So that is focus. What you focus on grows. The seeds, you're, you're, you are sowing seeds of scarcity, the seeds of lack, the seeds of not enough or not having. So the more that you say, I don't know, the less you will know. Even that which you have, even that which God is liberally willing to give, abundantly able to bestow, the knowledge, the answers, the solutions, the, the wisdom, that which God is pleased to give you, you shut up the blessings of heaven by saying, I don't know. So this is a, uh, a phrase that I really believe we would do well to eliminate from our vocabulary because it doesn't serve you, it doesn't serve Christ, and it doesn't serve those around you. And if you really want to uh, dedicate your talents to Christ's service, we have to recognize that if we don't, if we don't have wisdom, where, where will we find it liberally? By asking asking God who gives to all men abundantly and abraded not. He doesn't, he doesn't chastise us for saying it. Yes. And, and it's, it's really life-saving too because if you think about in, in the 70s when Apollo 13 um, was, you know, the spacecraft went out and then there was a big explosion and, and then it was like, Houston, we have a problem. What if they said, I, I don't know. 
you know, and they didn't search out for that answer. That saved saved people's lives. Praise so. the Lord. Sister Alonso, you want to share? Yes, I wanted to um, say that sometimes even though we don't see the way, you know, it is about um, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we always have to have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. But God knows the end from the beginning. Even though we don't see a way, he will. And having that faith provides us with that, you know, opportunity to just prove that we we are relying on him and not on ourselves which brings me to the verse that i wanted to share which is obviously proverbs uh, chapter 3 5 and 6 which i'm sure we all know trust in the lord with all thine heart and lean not onto thy own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path so it's not about us necessarily knowing uh what to do but us knowing that god will provide a way god will see us through it and and it's okay for us not to know. In fact, that's the beautiful thing about having faith and knowing that, you know, we can be still and know that He is our God and He will see us through if we will rely just solely on Him and not ourselves, not our own understanding because, you know, we're, we're just men. We're not God. Amen. I really appreciate you sharing that. It's true. The best leadership is not about having all the answers as it is of knowing where to find them. And we realize that when we're asking these questions, these aren't questions to ask yourself. These are questions to ask God. God, what can I be grateful for about this situation? How could I, like, what is the answer? And, and I want to give you something really practical, a way that you can eliminate I don't know from your vocabulary. And for me, I make it a, a I purposely, intentionally do not try to tell people to stop doing things without giving them something better. Because Romans 12, 21, it tells us this principle, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. With good. So it's not enough to just take away. We have to literally, every time that we say, I don't know, we have to use that as a trigger to form a better habit. That is now going to be, when you find yourself saying, I don't know, you, you could say instead, you could say, but I know who does. Let's mm -hmm. pray. And when you pray, James 1.5, uh, he gives to all men liberally. So what will help is recognizing that when there is that, qu that the temptation to say, I don't know, then say, but I know who does. Let's pray and pray to the one who's willing to give you all the answers and recognize that you have all the knowledge po necessary in Christ Jesus to accomplish your calling, to fulfill your responsibilities for this day. And God is uh, abundantly able to provide. Uh, but this, this, I don't know, the scarcity is really causing a lot of pain and misery, suffering and loss in our life. Um, and we would do well to, to ditch this, this scarcity mindset. Um, but I, I, uh, I really want us to see that God is, um, that God is, God is working in, in your lives. I don't believe it's coincidence that you came this far, that you're like going through this training. I believe that God has a special plan for your life, that God is seeking to do something very unique for you that not everybody has like this, this privilege to understand these truths in God's Word because they so practically apply to all areas of life. So, um, I encourage you that, that if you didn't take notes, this might be one of those things where you want to rewatch again and then take notes later and then review your notes. Really try to internalize them because again, gratitude is like a muscle. This abundance is, is, is not about what you have or how much you have. It's about are you grateful? How grateful are you with that which you have? This wealth is a mindset. Wealth is a um, it is a, an attitude of gratitude because the number one greatest blocker of abundance is ingratitude. And ingratitude can make a rich man poor, but gratitude can make a poor man rich. It's nothing to do with how much you have. And if you can't learn to be faithful in that which you have right now, then how is God going to trust you with more? That's Luke 16, 10. So by being extremely faithful with who you know, what you have, it will make a profound impact in your life and the lives of others around you. And this is the secret to wealth. Is it wrong to be wealthy? Absolutely not. It is God's plan for us to have an abundance of faith, 
to have health uh, more abundantly, that our, our health may prosper, our soul may prosper, that we can have abundant relations and connection with our family. God puts isolated into families. And you see that isolation, the solitude, I mean, that, um, that, that's a scarcity. All the pain, all the misery, all the suffering we experience in life is a result of scarcity thinking and a scarcity mindset. When you really believe that the, the principle of heaven is an abundant, limitless, um, overflowing uh, principle, then, then we stop worrying and stop stressing and, and we learn to, to recognize that in order to really practically apply this to our lives, we have to focus on the skill of asking great questions. Learn to ask great questions. Devour anything you can. For me, I study everything I can about asking questions because I recognize this is the secret to abundance in our life is the quality of your life comes down to the questions the quality of the questions that you ask yourself and this is how um, and these questions are not being asked asked to you they're being asked to God and God is answering this is the power of prayer um, and God gives wisdom to us and he helps us so um, one thing that I, I do want to encourage you is if you want to be faithful and if you want to take in consideration really what you have and have that attitude of gratitude to start recognizing the blessings that you have, uh, what we've done is we've actually put together this uh, very special book. This is called the Live Your Calling Daily Account Book. And in this account book, there's a section uh, where if you want to make gratitude a habit that leads to the wealth in your life, then there is a gratitude journal in here. I would highly recommend to grab a copy of this because here we write down what are the things we're grateful for every day. We start recognizing the blessings we do have because think about it. What if you woke up tomorrow with only the people you were grateful for today, that you express gratitude to, that you appreciated today? Who would be missing from your life tomorrow? Who, how would that affect your life? But if you start to cultivate this attitude of gratitude, it can transform your life. And not only that, we have a section where we could be intentional with our relationships, where it's who do I need to reach out to today and to recognize there are relationships that matter most to you and that you don't want to let fall through the cracks. And as leaders, we, we are here to be, to use our relationships to connect others to Christ. And um, so having, we created a system based on the biblical principles, a system to help you to really take inventory and keep account of what are the great things that you do have, how can you be faithful with that which you have, how can you um, recognize and strengthen that attitude of gratitude, and in the, be in, in the morning there is a section of questions. You want to know how to master the skill of asking questions, to ask great questions, there are 10 questions, some of the most profound, life-transforming questions that you can ask on a daily basis that applies to any calling of life, any person, any stage, that when you ask these questions, it will transform who you are in Christ. You'll never see the world the same again. And um, I, I really believe that if you grabbed a copy of the Live Your Calling Daily Account book, and you started to go through the system that is here being taught that basically takes everything that I showed you today and encapsulate it in one daily uh, routine day and turns these principles into habits so it's not just intangible theories and ideas and they're like, oh yeah, that sounds nice, but how does that fit with this problem? If you want to take these principles to your specific problem on a daily basis, this account book is going to help you tremendously. Um, if you want to grab your copy, all you have to do is go to the website, thearmyofyouth.com forward slash account book, and you can pick up your copy today. That's again, thearmyofyouth.com forward slash account book. And um, I am so excited to be able to see each of us just being transformed day by day as we recognize the abundance that we already have today. You don't have to wait. You can choose to be wealthy in Christ by recognizing and being grateful for the blessings that He has. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And 
Um, if, you, if there's anyone that you think could benefit from this, this Bible study, this training, then I encourage you to share this with other people. Let others know. Invite them to come next time. We do this every week, and uh, this, is, this is such a blessing. Who do you know that needs to hear this? Who do you know that is suffering with scarcity? Who do you know that's hurting, not out of rebellion, but maybe they're just not aware of this message that you have. We have a duty to not hoard this light to ourselves, but to share it with those around us. Remember, friends, that leadership is the skill of influence, nothing more and nothing less. Every man, woman, and child has influence, but the question is, are we using that influence to lead others to Christ?